Hi, I'm Seamless, and this is a walkthrough video for my track Arc, which was a submission to Loopop's competition to make a track out of a bunch of sampled, unreleased synthesizers that he collected from I already forget what show, but um, that's what this whole track is. And this is a little handy dandy look through how things are. I also go over how I did the video stuff, but for the most part, that was kind of a fun extra deal to do at the end. So, um, the. I'll work, I guess, from the bottom up. Let's do the drums first. So this first guy, um, I forget already what pack this is from, but the 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 names of the things that they are called is the most handy, the handiest thing here. So the base of the kick is configured as such. They have the low end on that sample, which is this dude. Yeah. I hope that meant something because I've already I already forget what most of this stuff is called and from, and some of them are not labeled. So I am mostly guessing. And then this guy, though, uh, this is the same technique I used when I was putting together drums <clears throat> when I had the drum brute, which makes sense because it's the same kind of analog source stuff. A boop, a bap, and a bip. And together, you can see this guy has flipped phase. And it's not just that the phase is flipped that makes this a handy, helpful thing, but it's also that like when I adjust how loud they all are together, this adjusts the character of this particular kind of kick which is cool because independently it'd be difficult to get any style of kick that came from any kind of synthesized source to be mixable into something that you can turn into like a track like this uh, in a modern sense because a lot of that power is distributed across different kinds of bits of the spectrum which like when I'm doing kind of synthetic stuff I could try real hard to put together like this but when you're using sort of sample deals like this the art is to put it all together from all these disparate bits and baps. Same deal with the snare, the low end of the, the fundamental tone bit. This thing, which I'm pretty sure was a tom. And then this guy, uh, nice top end, high end. Basically just sounded like that. Wasn't the hell all that else to the sound and by their powers combined. I have, I'm not compressing these two signals together for them to sound like that other than to say that they're all being compressed by the bus. The bus is compressing considerably but uh, this is usually I would do this kind of thing at like the sample level. I would compress these two together to, to be the sample. There's a bunch of hats going to reverb. And what's also fun about splitting up the kick like this is I get to use the really short bippy bit to be the side chain. It's actually pretty important that I used, in this case, a ghost click to do, well, not a ghost click because we can hear it, a click to do side chaining instead of my usual automated kind of sense, even though I am also doing automated kind of sense stuff on for the master, is because of uh, the fact that I wanted to utilize linear phase mixing to preserve as much as I could of the, of the phase reality, but that meant that the automation timing was going to be weird. In fact, if I play this right now, this will sound different than the rendered version. I'm just going to go play right into it, so get ready to turn this down. Turn it down. Hope you did. That sounds weird and off-time and clanky, doesn't it? And it's because I am running this at uh, 96 points per quarter when I actually made the whole track at 960 points per quarter. And I did that because I knew that I was going to do this maneuver. Which... The success of that is completely dependent on FL's like resolution to do a curve correctly, and it does it better than more points there are per quarter. So that's uh, why that's like this. But because that uses a, a, just an absolute monster amount of CPU, I had to turn that down just so that I can do this walkthrough and record it at the same time. Um, yeah. So that's the whole drum bit. Let's let's talk about this main bass guy. So this this tappy bit is two parts. There's a sub, and there's this guy. So now this guy doesn't actually sound like this at all. Well, here's what it sounds like without any of the effects. And what I did to that is distorted it. This uh, is, was a problem I had to fix. And then that. So the re oops, the reason why this is here and then there's just another EQ is because 
when you move these things, the motion is translated into a value that does show up after this process. So if I and it'll show up as a DC offset plus or minus. So if I want to really cap it, I have to cap it with a cap that doesn't move. Is the only reason why that's there. And I'm also using this as a filter. So that's that main dude. And the sub is basically actually just the same thing. Lower frequency. Which one are you? Is that this guy? Yeah. I left one of the ringy belly guys because those dudes tend to work out well when you low pass them. Has that kind of bass guitar kind of texture to it. Which, I mean, sometimes when you're playing a bass guitar, you can get kind of bellish tones out of it. Isn't that something? Featured also. It's a big, a big bomber. We all like bombers. That is the, 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 the nymphs. Whatever, which one that one was. Uh, what else am I getting? I got a bunch of ARP stuff. This guy is just a generalized texture package that I am employing. Mostly reverb. And this frequency shifter is on way up to on this extra chain that we're not hearing except for the fact that it is reverb and it's causing that extra like glisteny feel to be on top of this. Um, what else? Oh yeah, Mr. Choir Man. I like this guy. This big, this big burst of chord that just kind of shows up every once in a while. Uh, also a nymphs. Yeah. Oh wait, no. This was one of the Waldorf's. And then there's, there's the lead. Another one. Love it. Uh, here you can see this is the filter shape that made the actual pluck happen. It's just here in, in the element. I'm moving the filters sort of base roots up and down and it's causing the sort of range and motion to occur over the time with the big fills being at the end opening up so that well actually closing up so instead of the pluck going down at the, the bottom kind of comes up on it and uh, makes it be mostly high frequencies which is what kind of turns up at the end of these sections. I would on this one if, it, if I weren't uh, limiting down on the, on the low pass for the intro over here though. That's what it sounds like fully opened. I believe I covered everything I have used in here. So let's talk about the video. So I believe I can actually show this without dying because now we're doing the 96 uh, thingy. So this is four um, almost identical. I, I really wanted them to be identical, but I, I, I started this wrong for this that to have it had happened. Um, but what it is is a bunch of these strange acids, which are set up in just a way to look like this, and then I'm 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 moving the size of it to make it look like it's being pulled through, and I made four of them so that they could do this cascading thing, and you can kind of tell here that like here's one of them, there's the other one, there's the other one, there's the other one, and like by the time rhythmically that they're done, they end up restarting, so it just sort of looks like there's always one of them coming. Um, after that, there's the strict, the actual specific ones that I'm modulating, like the how this all ended up having its vague three dimensional like relationship was a total accident. Like I, I knew it would kind of do something like that, I had no idea that how exactly specifically it would turn out. Um, but what I did was I made all that into a layer, which is like putting it into a mixer insert and then layered it into um, another ascend here, a visual send on top of a solid color background because this guy doesn't have a background and if I try to do something like um uh, uh actually frame blur yeah way over here uh the frame blur won't dissipate because it'll just be drawn permanently on the on the background unless there is actually like a presently redrawn background which is why they're like which is what I'm doing with solid color here although I'm not actually frame blur frame blurring it here so I didn't didn't even need to keep that there but I did and then I'm blooming it which is giving us a kind of 
Halo-ish sort of visual. That's coming out of here, and I'm combining the original dotted unbloomed version with uh, the bloomed version, and then I'm displacing it by the bloomed version, which is where we're getting that kind of weird sort of black hole effect that that business is happening because of the displacement here. And it's displacing it according to um, the big bloomed guy. You can sort of see... Uh, Actually, this guy is not being shown. This is another bloom on top of this that's doing the bloom here. That's what the bloom is. So you can see how like there's more black and white starkness here. And then if I do this, there's a blend in between them. And because there's that blend in between them on this other layer that's not this layer, that blend is the thing that can apply itself onto the displacement, which is making that happen. The reason I like doing this kind of thing is not unlike regular base sound design. I like it when the visual's motion is Im impacted by things you can see, you know, extra dimensionally. Uh, so that's out of there, and then it's being pixelated, which is another cool effect. This one in particular is awesome because it's being triggered, it, or rather it's done, being done by a mask. It's not just uniformly like pixelating like this. Exactly where and how big the pixels form is being determined by another layer. So the way that masking works for these sorts of things is that light and dark become positive v or intensity and value. So the, the areas where they, they are are being, uh, and this is, I'm doing this by the bloom layer again, so then in the area where there's brighter light, pixelization is happening harder. And outside of it where it's darker, it's not. So that's why we're able to have like a blend of both. And then I'm color correcting it so that we're, we're getting this effect, like the saturation on extra coloring like on those artifacts is happening. And also like what we're seeing it right now in here is because of how small this window is. Like the nature of the, the effect is different based on how it's rendered. And like, I had to actually render that to see any of it, to know how to change these parameters to make them like kind of okay. And I'm not doing as much work as I could on this because I'm almost out of time to submit this. <laughs> and then an extra frame blur at the end, mostly to like for photo sensitivity, because essentially what this is, is like adding a release tail to flashing lights. So instead of being bah, bah, the lights are bah, bah. and that's, basically what you do to stop flashing lights from being a problem is that they don't flash strobe so hard because there's literally a tail a release in between them just like you would a hard gated sequence it's really interesting how much audio and visual stuff is just the same signal theory it's really weird anyway that was a lot of fun to work on this track uh thanks to loopop for going to the, that show and recording all these awesome synth sets that like inspired me almost immediately to make this um it was a lot of fun i hope y'all have also had fun doing that competition if you heard about it if you haven't heard about that uh the loop pop dude the guy is basically my gold standard for hardware reviews i pretty much don't do hardware reviews because there's no way i'm going to do it anywhere near as good as that guy so why not bother he's done it all it's awesome yeah if you have any questions about this please let me know don't forget to like comment subscribe and all that good stuff and as usual have a nice day